This is TJ Jones, the host of the State of the Saints podcast. And the State of the Saints podcast is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Over 2 million men worldwide choose Manscaped for all their below-the-waist needs. For those that love the Lawnmower 3.0, well, I got news for you. The Manscaped engineering team has confirmed that they have successfully created the Lawnmower 4.0. The Lawnmower 4.0 gives you the ability to turn the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. The new trimmer even allows you to customize your trim all through additional guards lengths, sizes one through four. And looks wise, it's sleek with a two-tone matte and gloss finish, even features a hot foil stamp, black chrome Manscaped logo. Show your more off loud and proud. Go to manscaped.com, use the promo code State of Saints, and you will save 20% off of the lawnmower 4.0 as well as other manscaped items that's manscaped.com Hey, what's going on, Who That Nation? It is yours truly, TJ Jones, the host of the State of the Saints podcast. And we have a special guest with us here on the State of the Saints podcast. We have from the NFL Network back again on the State of the Saints podcast. We have Mr. Steve Weiss. Steve, how you doing? I'm good, man. Trying to be like you, my man. Hope all is well. (laughs) <laughs> well, I appreciate it first off because we're, we're doing the show like around 11:30, so I know it's 8:30 out there on the West Coast. So thank you for getting up with us uh, <laughs> and doing this interview. I appreciate that. No pressure. I got to get up early every day because all you know everything's happened on the East Coast already, and we got Sony Michelle getting traded to the Rams and everything yeah. else, and all this stuff <laughs> early in the morning. So yeah, I'm up, my man. Good to start the day with you. Yeah, thank thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, especially when it comes to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, Saints had a, a, a Monday night football game uh, against the Jacksonville Jaguars, and this was the first time we've seen in a very long time Jameis Winston uh, starting an NFL game. And he lit it up. Uh, it was 9 of 10, about 120-plus yards and two touchdowns. I mean, two dimes. Uh, uh, a lot of people are starting to change their minds a little bit about uh, Jameis Winston. Uh, Steve, what do you think about Jameis Winston's performance? And uh, do you think he solidified himself as the starter of the New Orleans Saints going into the 2021 season? I think he did. And and I think it was his job to lose. You know, they didn't sign him as a backup and as a free agent. He didn't sign as a backup if he didn't think he really had a great shot to win this job and didn't have the confidence. Um, That performance was fantastic because, you know, the two touchdown throws are the ones everyone's going to, you know, be so excited about. But those were two low percentage throws. And Mark West Calloway. Had to make some great catches, but any receiver would have to make great catches on those deep balls, being covered like they were, right? Yeah. So that, you know, both players should share in the glory of that. Yeah. But to me, watching Jameis, it was the intermediate throws and the on-scheduled throws, the rhythm that he was, you know, he would drop back, drop back, boom, balls out. Right. Okay, and that's something that he's got to do in a Sean Payton system, and that's something he's got to do if he wants to enhance his career. You know, yeah. and, and, I, and I tell you, you know, we had Jameis, Jameis Jim Trotter and I on our podcast last year. Or he said, you know, he, he was always taught that playing quarterback in football is a results-oriented business. Right. But with the Saints, Drew Brees taught him it is a process-oriented business. You right. handle the process, the results come. Mm-hmm. And you never know if a player like Jameis, who is always played hero ball, trying to be that guy to make the great throw, yeah. if it's going to 
absorb, you know, when the, when the moment arises. And so far he's shown that it has. So yeah. good for him because I do think the Saints are better off with him at quarterback and Taysom playing that high, hybrid role. Yeah. I, I just think that the pressure is off Jameis Winston. I think when you're the first overall pick, there's a lot of expectations. Uh, you know, him coming to the Tampa Bay franchise, I mean, they're the first, they got the first pick for a reason. So a lot of fans are looking at him to be the savior of the franchise. But you look at the New Orleans Saints over the last couple of years, I mean, they've won a lot of games. So all he has to do is go out there and play as efficient as he can. And I think the Saints, uh, you know, have enough in order for them to win uh, some of those football games. So real, 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 real quick, to go say ahead. the pressure is off Jameis Winston, come yeah. on now. You are replacing a Hall of Famer. Okay. If you, if you don't at least play somewhat near that standard mm. and have them in contention to win the division, oh, there is pressure all over you. <laughs> to fill in to if you're if you're a coach stepping in to fill, you know, when Jimmy Johnson had to step in for Tom Landry and finish one and fifteen, right? That's pressure. You better right. bounce back quickly. When you're stepping in, when Cam Newton stepped in behind Tom Brady, there's pressure. Right. So Jameis ain't off the hook now. He, yeah. he, he's got to step up and play. Well, I, I okay, but I, I just feel this way. Okay, maybe I'm looking at it a little bit different. Okay, because I look at the Saints. They won a lot of games, even when Drew Brees wasn't there. there there's a, yes. there's a, a supporting cast around him. I feel like in, in in Tampa during that time, he had to do a lot. There, they didn't really have a really good offensive line. They really didn't have a good running game. They, I mean, Mike Evans was young, Chris Godwin was young, so it, it was a lot of pressure on him. When I look at the Saints, it's like. They got leadership. They got the leadership inside the locker room. They got players that can make plays, and it's not just all on him. But I, I, I agree with you yeah. with the expectations of Drew Brees. I mean, coming from New Orleans, I completely understand that and the expectations uh, that we have when it comes to the quarterback position as Saints fans. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that part. Yeah, but let's go ahead. Let's talk about Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill did play in, in the game. And, uh, Steve, I use this example. I said, you know, I, I talk about the, the great James Brown, like James Brown will put on a great performance, and all of a sudden the guy come on stage and put the coat over him and uh, walk him off stage. I said, just imagine, you know, James Brown putting on this great performance. The coat goes on stage, and you have to follow that up. I, I feel like that was the way Taysom uh, had to come into the game after Jameis Winston just lit it up. But uh, what do you think about uh, Taysom Hill? Uh, do you think that, uh, you know, Taysom Hill can be – uh, a starting quarterback uh, in the National Football League if it doesn't work out for the New Orleans Saints? Uh, do you think he needs to embrace uh, that Swiss Army knife role that he has carved out, a, uh, you know, carved out a path for himself? He needs to embrace that role because I will tell you this right now. If he, if he hits free agency, teams are going to be looking at him more as that Swiss Army knife player than they will be a quarterback right. because they can go draft a quarterback. You know, there's going to be movement among players, possibly Russell Wilson, possibly Aaron Rodgers. You know, there's going to be some quarterback movement still next year. Yeah. So he's not he's not going to get the opportunity or have a coach believe in him like Sean Payton right. does. Because Sean Payton's got security. Right. Right. If You know, if someone like Matt Nagy and the Bears, right, with their mm -hmm. quarterback issues, would they go right. get him and, and bank his coaching, you know, you know, survival rate on that? No. Yeah. He's not going to do it. So I think he needs to embrace that. Right? I'm sure there are people – who think he can play quarterback, but no one is really going to step out on a limb for him like Sean Payton has. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, I, I look at Taysom Hill, and, and like I said, he carved out a path for himself. I, I really feel that Tim Tebow got an opportunity in Jacksonville because of the type of player Taysom Hill has, has turned out to be. And you find yourself looking at a lot of these teams trying to find that, that Taysom Hill type player. I, I go back to uh, last year, week 17 versus the Carolina Panthers, you had the Carolina Panthers. I mean, they had Tommy Stevens, the the rookie out of Penn State. They had him kind of doing that, that uh, Taysom Hill type thing. So I think if he wants to stay in the league, and, and you know, I, I feel like he, like I said, um, like you said, uh, he needs to embrace that that particular role. I mean, this guy got like twenty one million dollars. You know, <laughs> being a Swiss Army knife, not many. Backup quarterbacks can actually uh, say that, you know, and, and not many backup quarterbacks can say that, you know, they, they have a whole new position for themselves for them to actually hit the field because most backup quarterbacks, for the exception of if a quarterback gets hurt, that's the only time they're going to see some playing time. Uh, but 
let me talk a little bit about the defense. Uh, defensively, the New Orleans Saints, uh, they look pretty good this season, but they, they still uh, there's still some uh, issues for the number two cornerback position. We know Marshawn Lattimore, uh, he's borderline elite as a cornerback, but uh, they lose Janoris Jenkins to the Tennessee Titans, and now you have uh, Ken Crawley, who is in his second stint with the Saints. They also drafted Paulson Adebo out of Stanford. Uh, what do you think about the Saints' uh, number two cornerback position? Uh, do you think that, you know, looking at some of these younger players, drafting guys like Paulson Adebo, should they try to give him opportunity? Or maybe the Saints should try to be aggressive, maybe trade or look in free agency to try to fill that number two void? Well, you know, we have to see. Um, I think right now they're comfortable mm. because I think they believe so much in their defensive front to put pressure on quarterbacks. It's not mm. going to make that number two cornerback situation such a potential liability. And look, it's, they're not unique. I mean, there's a lot of teams in the NFL that don't have that excellent corner opposite of their star corner. Right. So that's not unique. So, but I do think they're going to keep their, you know, their eyes out there and their ears to the ground. If, mm. you know, let's say, Richard Sherman is cleared and, and, and everything's okay and they, they want to take a chance on Sherman. Um, yeah. Let's say, you know, a player gets cut, a veteran player gets cut for salary cap purposes or, or something in that realm after, you know, this third preseason game. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they bring a player like that in just to mm-hmm. give them a shot and see if they can fit because they've got to have depth. Yeah. I mean, that's a position where there are injuries. It's a position where you play a lot of sub packages. In this division, teams are going to be throwing the ball an awful lot. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they went out, even if it's not a starting caliber player, somebody can come in, you know, play corner, play inside, possibly have the, the flexibility to play safety too if that player becomes available, you know, yeah. after cuts, you know, or or in a trade for a player that likely could be get cut, be getting yeah. cut. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at this this young uh, cornerback uh, group. I mean, these guys are really making plays. And uh, I look at Paulson Adebo coming out of Stanford, uh, I mean, the lights have not been too bright for him. I mean, he's been making plays. He's an instinctive player. He's a really smart player. And also with uh, Ken, Ken Crawley, I mean, his second stint, I mean, he's looked really good out there in preseason. He had a, a pass breakup uh, against Jacksonville. So uh, it's always positive to see, like, some of these guys stepping up. And also, if they continue to make plays, uh, you know, coaches may look at that and say, hey, maybe we need to go into the season and see what these young guys have and, you know, see if it'll work out then. So, Oh, we'll, we'll see, you know, but I mean, and, I and, 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 a football team, uh huh. And quickly on that, TJ, don't forget who the secondary coach is, right? It's Chris Richard, right? Right, he's done this before. He's yeah. taken young corners like a Richard Sherman, that's true, and 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 developed them. Mm-hmm. You know, he he did that in Dallas with Byron Jones, who's yeah. now with the Miami Dolphins on a big yeah. contract. So, you know, you have to factor that in too. Is like as the season goes along, these guys are gonna get better, more comfortable in Dennis Allen's scheme right. because they've got a great teacher in Chris Richard. Yeah. I mean, I look at I have so much respect for Chris Richard. The fact that he was out of football completely last year was mind blowing to me. Uh, I think that he deserves way more credit, uh, especially for that, uh, you know, Dallas Cowboy defense. I know Rob Marinelli was uh, the defensive coordinator, but I mean, I think that he he helped out tremendously, uh, built up, helped build up the confidence of Jalen Smith, Lathan Van Der Esch. Those guys were playing really good out there. And also that young secondary, I mean, that the Cowboys had. I mean, the Cowboys. They, they had a, a really good run defensively when he was uh, the assistant defensive coordinator out there. And I'm glad that he's here. You know, I mean, you hear a lot of the uh, same secondary players talking about how hands on he is, you know, working with them. You know, he, he talked about they talked about the difference between Aaron Glenn being here last year and how hands on and how, you know, how much of a teacher Chris Richard is. So it, it's great to have him on board. Uh you know, and it's a good uh, it's good to actually have somebody like him, a good defensive mind and a guy that, like you said, uh, really trained some of the best uh, players that have ever played the secondary, the legendary Legion of Boom. You know, he's the mastermind behind that. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about the NFC South uh, and, and where the Saints match up. Uh, last year, they won the division. Of course, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are the Super Bowl champions. And uh, you also have the Carolina Panthers who've had uh, two really good uh, drafts over the last couple of years. And the Atlanta Falcons, they they have, a, a you know, a new um, front office. They have Terry, Terry Fontenot coming over from New Orleans Saints, and he is the, the new uh, general manager of the Falcons. So uh, let's start with Tampa Bay. Uh, do you feel they are the, the class of the NFC South? And if so, uh, what do these, some of these other teams have to do in order to catch up with? 
Well, Tampa's the class of the NFL right now. So, right. you know, not just the NFC South. They're the Super Bowl champions. They return right. all their starters. That's a hard thing, though, um, to replicate, right? right? The reason why I think that they are so dangerous has nothing to do with the offense. It has everything to do with the defense. Because it was the final four games of the regular season, the playoffs for the defense that Todd Bowles led was fairly healthy, and right. they got everything going. Remember, they got Vita Via Vi- back towards the end of the season on the defensive front. That really right. boosted things. They've got two of the best inside linebackers um, in the NFL. You know, yeah. Devin White is especially, you know, spectacular where he can run and deliver a thump. He's got all the guys on the back end, including Winfield, who's just right. – he's going to be a great player, yeah. uh, potential Hall of Famer. So they're, they're the team to beat. And I think, again, the defense is going to be what's problematic for the team. They're not going to be perfect by any measure. But then I think that's where the Saints come in. No. Because I think they're going to be really good. I mean, and some people are like, well, they lost you, Breeze. You're not going to be as good. And, you know, let's go back to that defense. Yeah. That's been their bread and butter the past two seasons, regardless. They played their best when Drew yeah. was out, when Teddy Bridgewater had to take over two years ago, when Taysom Hill took over last year. Right. Um, you know, we talked about some of the lack of depth in the secondary, but they, I mean, they they got one of the best front sevens and some depth and rotation of rotation flexibility in there in the NFL. So I think that's going to happen. They've got an excellent offensive line, you know, not having Michael Thomas hurts. And now some of the depth issues with injuries at tight end, you know, and we know how Sean Payton can coach up tight ends and scheme up tight ends. Right. That's an issue, but that's something that as as a season progresses, right. You know, you're not going to win the season in September, October, you're going to win it later in the season. Yeah. So you just have to kind of continue to evolve, which I think they will with, with James quarterback. Um, as they get going, when it comes to Carolina, this is a team I'm really interested in, you know, because we don't know if Sam Darnold, you know, got got really damaged with the Jets. We don't know if he couldn't play at all. And, you know, just what happened with the Jets part, you know, heavily on him yeah. because Matt Rule and Joe Brady can coach. Right. You talk yeah. to other people in the NFL and they're like, man, those those are some real guys. Yeah. And, and so, like you mentioned, the drafts If all those young players on defense that they took last year with and got a year of experience, if they mature. They're an interesting team to me, man. They're going to have Christian McCaffrey back. They've got some speed on the edges at wide receiver. Yeah. Um, you know, they drafted J.C. Horn. I, I, they're an interesting team to me. I think they could be a real pain in the neck. And the Falcons are the wild card because, right. you know, they've got Matt Ryan. We know how good and how consistent he's been. Yeah. Calvin Ridley is going to be fine. People say, oh, there's no Julio. He's the number one. Calvin Ridley's been double teamed his whole life. I've talked <laughs> to defensive coordinators, too, and they played Falcons play the Falcons, yeah. they double team Calvin Ridley. Yeah. And, you know, maybe with their two and three guys, and they put the number one guy on Julio. Yeah. Um, but with, with Atlanta, it's not going to work if their offensive line doesn't work. And, and that's that's the big concern because you have to run the ball for the scheme to function properly. If they can't run and Matt Ryan's got to throw the ball 40 times a game, that's going to be problematic. But I think defensively they're going to be better um, than a lot of us were thinking. You know, I've done some stuff with them in preseason. I call two of their preseason games. Mm-hmm. And, man, they've got some inside linebackers and some guys up front who can play. I mean, they don't have the world beater putting pressure on guys, but with Dean Pease, um, who's done it in New England, done in Baltimore, and done in Tennessee as a new defensive coordinator, he'll come up with sack by proxy, so to yeah. speak. You know, and, and so an interesting team. I don't think from top to bottom it's going to be as competitive as it has been in previous years. I still think the Saints and Bucks are the teams to beat, but – I don't think there's any reason why the Saints cannot be a playoff team, whether they win the division or come in as a wild card this year. I, I just I, I believe in Sean Payton. I believe in Dennis Allen, and I believe in the culture they have there. And I believe in the talent. Yeah, I believe in the talent. I mean, they're 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 not as bereft as some people may think, just because Drew Brees retired. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at this New Orleans Saints team. I think the, the sky's the limit for them. You know, as, as far as like where they can actually go. And um, I, I do think that Jameis Winston, if he does become the starter, I mean, he he, he gives the Saints a, a completely different dynamic offensively. Like I, I was looking at next gen stats, he threw a pass uh, to Marquez Callaway, the thing with fifty three point six yards. That's the longest air distance pass that the Saints had since twenty sixteen. So it, it's not like when when Drew Brees was here, a lot of teams were playing cover two. You know, they were you know playing the sticks. You know, it, it's it's different. You got to respect the fact that he can throw the ball down the field. So I think that if they combine that with a really good uh, defensive performance week in, week out, I, I think that the Saints can uh, be a double-digit win team. And 
And you talk about Carolina, I feel the same way. Like Carolina is one of those uh, mystery teams. But, I mean, you look at the draft, drafting all defensive players uh, last year and then had a really solid draft uh, this year. Um, I mean, I think Carolina can be a really good team. And uh, as far as Atlanta, I think Atlanta, uh, if they, you know, can play consistent, they can win some football games as well. But a uh, final question for you, uh, Steve, uh, if you – uh, could guess who do you think is going to win the NFC South and why? I like the Bucks. Um, again, like I mentioned, the defense. You know, I just think with all that talent at all three levels, they're going to be a pain in the neck. It's not going to be easy. I mean, because yep. everyone's coming at them. Saints are going to be good. You know, we talked about Carolina being a mystery team, but I think it'll be the Bucks. I do think the Saints get into the playoffs, um, and we'll see. I mean. You know, look, bringing all those guys back is a wonderful thing. But keeping all those guys healthy over a seventeen game season, yeah. the, the the teams in the playoffs this year are going to be the healthy teams. Yeah, right. It's going to be the team, and the ones that go to the Super Bowl, the ones that are healthy and also playing well at the right time, like the Buccaneers were last year. Seventeen games is real. You know, yeah. one game. People say it's only one game. It's different, man. Yeah, it's different the way coaches have to practice them and, and things like that. So, but I like the Bucks. I like the Saints to be the top two teams in the in the, in the division. Yeah, I mean, I look at Tampa Bay. Uh, last season, you know, Tom Brady coming from New England to uh, Tampa, you had a lot of uh, people didn't know what to think about that. I mean, they had some up and down games uh, right before that bye. And I think when they went into the playoffs, I don't think a lot of people, you know, took them as serious as they should. I mean, they got like red hot after that bye week. And that's why I have like so much respect for teams like the Kansas City Chiefs. Like it's hard to repeat when you're a Super Bowl champion and everybody is coming at you and they're trying to give you their best shot. So Tampa is going to get everybody best shot. It, it's not going to be like they're going to be flying under the radar and eventually like they're going to get red hot. I mean, right. if they play uh, the Jets or they play the Saints. They're going to be getting everybody's best shot. So hopefully uh, they'll be up for the challenge. Uh, but Steve, uh, thank you so much for being a part of the State of the Saints podcast. Really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and let everybody know how they can get in touch with you and also just some of your, uh, you know, about your podcast and everything like that. Well, TJ, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Weich, W-Y-C-H-E, the number's 89, at Weich89. You can see me all over NFL Network's programming and uh, on, on their digital platforms. Cool. And hope, hopefully there'll be some, some more things uh, to come. But, TJ, you keep doing what you're doing, man. You're, you're, you're really providing a fantastic service and outlet. Yeah. for the Saints fans and for a lot of people and, and people are watching, man. So well done and, and just keep on doing, doing things the right way and, and continued success. Yeah. And thank you so much, Steve. Cause uh, you know, last year, you know, I asked you to, uh, to be on a podcast and you no, know, you could, you could easily told me, you know, I, I can't do it, you know, but I, I appreciate you, you know, uh, having the confidence in me coming on the show and, you know, and I appreciate you helping uh, me to, uh, you know, take my podcast to the next level. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you for being an inspiration also, you know, just uh, some of the uh, things that you talk about on, on your podcast and I um, mean, just the representation that you are. Well, appreciate you, man. All right. That's Steve Weiss, uh, ladies and gentlemen, who that nation on the state of the Saints podcast.